As a developer or operations engineer, have you ever been standing in front of your boss or project manager or engineering manager and you hear them say, we have to make this date no matter what, so don't worry about logging with anything more than just the bare minimum. I want you to just get enough out there so we can test, forget perfect logging, let's deliver. And of course you say, we can do that, but if you ever want to launch this at scale in production in front of customers, we're gonna have to add more capabilities around logging and whatnot. But they insist, they're like, look, we need to make this date because we have a customer meeting, we need to get customer feedback, we've got a customer commitment, or insert some other apocalyptic but probably true random statement here about the negative impact to the customer and the business. And so you deliver a minimally working piece of software that you know has technical deficiencies, but it meets the short-term needs of the business. And then three months later, the business comes back and you end up rewriting the entire logging section of your code because you rushed it to make that deadline knowing that you needed more features, more tracing, more observability, insert feature here, right? So you honor the short-term business need at the cost of some technical aspect, mainly technical quality and maintainability. This is intentional technical debt because it created an intentional deficiency in the quality of your code that you may or may not have to deal with later. In this case, we did, right? This, my friends, is why we are going to dive into the murky yet impactful world of technical debt. And in this video, we're gonna cover the following topics. What is technical debt? When is it just ignorable technical debt? When and how do we fix technical debt? What are some suggestions? And how do we avoid or reduce technical debt in our organization? I'm Michael Forrester. I'm a trainer with CodeCloud. Let's dive in. So let's talk first about what is technical debt and a little bit more about the types. Now, what we just described, that was an intentional technical debt. That was a decision to emphasize speed of delivery over technical adaptability or technical quality. This, by the way, was also what we did with CodeCloud version zero. The very first version of CodeCloud was built using no code. We used third-party services because we weren't sure that anyone would even use our system. When we built our lab environment, we built it with an existing product and not from scratch. We didn't code it ourselves. We cobbled everything together to make something to basically get a feel for user interests. We were creating a minimally viable product just to get customer feedback. And we used off-the-shelf software instead of writing an evolvable code base. This was an intentional design strategy on our part to emphasize speed to market and simplicity over future technical adaptability and future technical evolution. So our product had intentional technical debt, but it did also shorten the time to market and allowed us to understand our audience better so that we could go back and build a better product. This was purposefully done and is a great example of the intentional technical debt that we've been talking about. We intentionally created this technical debt and we were aware of both its cost and its future impact. Yeah. If there's intentional technical debt, what about unintentional technical debt? Well, this may be a surprise, but all software systems are gonna break down over time if they're not either maintained or evolved. This means on the maintenance side is that when you make an application, you have to update the libraries, the design code patterns, the methods, the classes, etc., or they will eventually break. Now on the evolution side, this means that you have to add new features and capabilities to your code over time, right? And so both of these, by the way, if you don't maintain your software or if you add new features, you're gonna create unintentional technical debt. So the problem with evolving software by adding those features in new libraries is that as the software grows, it gets more complex. As it gets more complex, it starts to stifle innovation, starts to reduce adaptability, it starts to inhibit delivery. These are all great indicators that you have technical debt. So, an unintentional technical debt can also arise when you didn't know at the time that you needed a particular design pattern. So it's not just maintenance and it's not just evolving. You could look and say, well, monolithic design patterns made sense to us because we didn't realize that we were going to scale to a million users like microservices. But later on, you realize that in order to scale, you've got to change the design pattern from a monolith to microservices. And the cost of that transition was bigger because you didn't even attempt to write your monolithic code base as if it would eventually be split into microservices. So most of us create unintentional technical debt in the future of our projects, either by not maintaining or ignoring them, by adding more features, or just by not keeping an eye on what the road ahead could look like. Either way, you're gonna increase technical debt over time, but does that mean that all technical debt actually needs to be addressed? 
When is it just ignorable technical debt? Tech debt is not real if you do not need to touch the code section in question. If basic logging is great for you, then it's not really technical debt. It's, an, it's like an ignorable, non-optimal design pattern or basically just a design choice. You can just ignore it. It's still technical debt. It's not going to cost you anything. So it's not a bug or a defect. It's just a design choice that you made and it's not going to cost you anything because you're not going to touch that design choice. So, you know, later on, you're not going to have to correct it because it's not inhibiting your ability to deliver. It's not slowing you down and it's not blocking any like ability on your part to evolve. So what this means is that it is not technical debt. If it is a design or code pattern that is not slowing down your ability to deliver code, it's not stifling innovation. It's not creating instability in your code. And I would add this last one is that it's not preventing your ability to run the code in production, right? To put this in the positive, to reverse this, technical debt is only present if you're seeing a slowdown in your ability to deliver, you're seeing stifled innovation, you see unpredictability in your ability to change the code, and you have something that prevents you from running it in a production facing capacity in a positive manner. That's it. Otherwise, it's a design choice. You can just ignore it. It's just tech debt that's just sitting in the corner. Now, what can you do then to reduce or avoid technical debt, right? So think of technical debt like financial debt. We've all had a credit card and paid interest to the bank. And if you pay just enough to pay off interest every month, you never really pay down the principal and therefore you never really get anywhere on the loan because the interest is just gonna stay the same, right? So the only way to really reduce the burden, the effects of technical debt is to get rid of it, right? And that's to make a payment that includes both the interest in our loan analogy and a chunk of the loan principal. And the more you pay down on your loan principal, the less interest you have to pay. There'll be less effects, right? So the, you know, less of a burden that you have from the debt. But there's more to it than that because are you reacting to debt or are you being proactive about it? What had you borrowing in the first place? Were there business needs overriding the technical needs or operational needs overriding developer needs? You have to really kind of look in your environment to, you know, to really understand what the pressures are that are causing technical debt. And so like credit cards, sometimes we borrow in the short term to meet a business need, even though it kind of inhibits us in the long term. And if we continue our analogy around debt, then we've got to be diligent about what we're getting out of this kind of trade-off. What are we borrowing for? What are the numbers? Are we regularly reviewing our finances to see what we can handle? Have we run the numbers to see what it really costs us for the cynical debt? Now, note that teams shouldn't just refactor and reduce technical debt that they just find on their own for its own sake. But in areas of code that you're sure you will touch or aware will become a pain point for you now or in the near future. Now, if you're going to reduce technical debt, the first step is to increase the visibility of technical debt. Pick the areas where the developers go uh, and they kind of cringe. Those are your pain points in your code base. Do some analysis. How healthy is it? There are tools out there for it, but know who has responsibility for what and audit the tools, the trouble tickets, the time to remediate bugs, figure out what departments are impacted right? This list will help you create a prioritized list of improvements and give you direction for where to start. With a prioritized list, you can start chipping away at that technical debt by refactoring the small technical debt items first, and then take on the larger projects later, right? This lets developers see small improvements to their efforts immediately rather than take on larger products with little immediate return on investment. This also allows you, by the way, to deliver features on your code which is something most product owners will tell you is essential for an active code base. You can't just take a month off and refactor, right? They'll tell you, well, we still need the little features, so give us something, right? Now, what about ongoing practices for avoiding technical debt? Because we just talked about reducing it, but can you avoid it? Now, it would be very impractical to eliminate technical debt altogether because anything you do is going to generate technical debt for the most part. But again, remember, ignorable technical debt, so not everything that you generate needs to be addressed, right? So, because, I mean, if you don't want to generate technical debt, that would mean adding no features to your code base and you would just sit there and constantly upgrade your libraries and test them. Now, that being said, here are some things to think about since we're talking about software projects, right? And these ideas can really help reduce technical debt. Make sure that everyone is in agreement about what good software practices are and follows them. This also means keeping up with evolving software practices and implementing them when and where it makes sense. So this should lead to good coding standards. This will also lead to maintaining maintainable code and refactoring as a portion of the work you do, you know, when you add features. So you're gonna do refactoring and you're gonna add features. So ensure that in your development pipeline also, in addition to good coding practices and good standards, 
that you have some kind of manual or automated code quality checking in your deployment pipeline. Either get some senior developer to mentor pair program, mob program with the juniors, or run their code through a bevy of the evolving machine learning based tools that are getting better and better every year, right? In addition, make sure that you are keeping an eye on good design and architectural practices, both in infrastructure and in code, and make sure you have good production practices as well. So it just can't be software engineering. It's also going to be good architectural practices and good production practices. This will help you avoid technical debt. Last but not least is keep an eye on the evolution of software engineering, architecture, and production practices because your application and your customers are going to grow and change, and so you're going to stay connected with that. So in summary, technical debt in software engineering is defined as prioritizing certain designs and patterns that are ideal for short-term goals, but that create future technical challenges that make future changes harder or impossible. So remember, this is when you prioritize short-term over long-term. And remember, technical debt doesn't really exist unless it's stifling innovation, creating unpredictability in software development, or if it's preventing proper operation of your software in some form or fashion. If you do this intentionally, meaning you prioritize something knowingly so that you can get short-term gain over long-term, that's intentional technical debt. If you do it on accident because you don't maintain your software, or just, you just grew your software, that's unintentional technical debt, right? So remember, unintentional is, is done on accident because or, or future needs arose that you didn't anticipate. Now, keep in mind that adding features to a code base always increases technical debt. And so one of the best practices to maintain is to, is to maintain good coding practices, automate code quality checks, make sure your architecture and your operational production practices are really good. Make sure everyone's in agreement on them. Remember this also, last note. Most companies accumulate tactical debt through years of short-term changes in code band-aids. It could take years, if not months, for you to reduce your technical debt. So just know that it's not a sprint, but it's a long-term marathon. It's okay to start lean, but just be ready to pay down technical debt. Add refactoring and reconfiguring for improvements as part of your operations and development playbook. And when you pay down technical debt, by the way, the business will see the maturity of your IT operation. It saves money, it saves time, saves developer frustration, and provides customers with overall a better product and a better customer experience. That's the end of this explanation on technical debt. My name is Michael Forrester. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you at my next video.